why do you do it? Why are you stressing yourself out over this? Why are you prematurely aging yourself? Why do you do it? I grew up in the country on a farm. And when I was about 13 years of age, my mum and I went off to our local capital city for a few days. But while we were there, she got a phone call that changed our lives forever. I remember her answering the phone, and immediately her jaw just dropped, her eyes opened wide, and then they turned to glass. We stayed in the city for a couple more days to deal with the fallout, and after what felt like an eternity, we started making the journey back home. Down the winding dirt roads, the green paddocks blurring past us outside of the car window, closer and closer we got until finally we arrived. And there it was, a pile of rubble. You see, my beautiful family home had been taken by the elements and turned into a mountain of ash and bricks. I could no longer see the room where my sisters and I performed amazing Spice Girls dance concerts. I could no longer see my mum's wedding dress. I no longer had any photos of myself as a baby. I got out of the car and immediately I was suffocated by this thick stench, a smell that I used to associate with a fun bonfire and now I just wanted it to go away. I inched closer and closer to where my bedroom used to be and I finally got to this wall, this invisible wall, and walked through and stood atop the rubble where my bed used to be. In this moment, I felt hopeless. My hands just dropped, my head, it blurred, and my heart was overwhelmed. But just as I was about to let self-pity defeat me, my parents called out, and they told me about what had happened the day before. You see, it turns out that my childhood best friend, who I'd kind of started drifting away from as we went to high school, had come out to visit the wreckage. And apparently he spent hours on his hands and knees digging through the bricks, digging through the ash, trying to find something that was mine, that was left intact, something that would bring a smile to my face. And this act of compassion and generosity spun me out of any sense of self-despair. And the generosity, it didn't stop with my friend. Our entire town of just 300 people rallied around us. I'd never seen anything like it. Strangers were dropping off food. People were offering us their houses to stay in. It was unlike anything. And when I look back, this was it. This was the moment that I realised what was important. In, hopefully, many years, when I'm on my deathbed, I'm not going to worry about the clothes that I'm wearing or the car that I drive. What is going to matter to me are the experiences I had, the relationships that I formed, the community around me, and what I did to make it better, what I did to give back the way that people gave back to me. I love thinking about people who do so much to benefit their community. Take Fred Hollows, for example, a man who saw so many Indigenous Australians suffering from preventable blindness that he dedicated his life to tirelessly restoring their sight. Or Malala Yousafzai, a young woman so dedicated to young women's education, she was willing to die for it. Shot in the head, but still working to achieve equal rights for young women in Pakistan. But why do they do it? Why do you do it? And how do we get more people to rally around and give back to their community? Well, for me, it was those relationships, it was the people but I saw two major issues that were impacting my community. The first were geographical barriers. Distance, time and funding barriers were impacting young rural students' education. Did you know that the more remote a student gets in Australia, the worse Year 12 completion rates are, the worse attitudes to schooling is? Often, youth unemployment is worse in rural areas. And sadly for young women, they often feel as though they have to make this choice, this choice between the city and the country, if they want the career, the education, the mentorship opportunities that they need to succeed. And the second issue that I saw impacting my community 
was gender inequality. So when I was at university, I wanted to be a journalist, and I got a job in a newsroom. And it just so happened to be during the time of Australia's first female prime minister. Should have been awesome, right? Well, day in, day out, the most sexist stories rolled through the newsroom, whether it was her hair, her clothes, her boyfriend. The prime minister's leadership capabilities were being belittled. It was awful. And no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, or even if you don't care about politics, you've got to admit it wasn't cool. And the impact that this type of public behaviour has on young women is startling. Study after study shows that young women rely on positive leadership role models. And study after study shows that young women start losing their self-confidence as they enter their teenage years. And did you know that a third of young women in a recent survey thought that it would be easier for them to score their dream job in Australia if they were a male? And when you kind of add this together and pair it with economic insecurity, LGBTIQ issues, racial discrimination, things are looking pretty tough. And so I started thinking, well, what type of impact is this having long term? If you look at the number of females sitting in parliament at the moment, it's just 30 percent. Half of our population are women, so why is it just 30 percent? And why do we have more men called Peter running our ASX 200 companies than women altogether? It was baffling to me. And this gender equality revolution had been going on for decades. So why? I got pretty fired up and I just wanted to join in. I wanted to help the amazing men and women who had been doing all of this work. And I saw this niche group of young women when you add these gender and geographical issues together and I thought, you know what, I want to do something. I want to take action. And then I had an idea. And that idea is called Country to Canberra. Country to Canberra is a nationwide not-for-profit that I founded that empowers young, rural and remote women to reach their leadership potential. We run a massive leadership competition and a power trip out to Australia's capital city to connect young women with political and business leaders and mentors. We run a blogger team that connects isolated girls to one another, mentorship programs, online networks, and this year we're going out into rural communities to run leadership workshops so that every girl, no matter where she is, no matter what her background is, has the opportunity to succeed. But at the beginning of Country to Canberra, it was just me. I had $2,000 and I was in a brand new city and I had absolutely no connections. It felt like this insurmountable challenge. But I realised that to be a change maker, it was actually pretty simple. I could do it, you can do it, everyone in this room can be a change maker. You just need three things. You need your hands, you need your head, and you need your heart. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by using your hands? Well, I mean get out there and create action. Every individual, no matter who you are, has the ability to create influence. I think sometimes as young people we feel as though there are these huge institutions and it's really hard to get in there and actually create meaningful change or we're young, so we might not have the financial experience or the kind of governance acumen that you need to create change. Well, let me tell you, when I started Country to Canberra, I didn't have any not-for-profit experience. Honestly, but I learned. I learned how to create a website. I learned how to do accounting. That wasn't fun, but I did it anyway. <laughs> and I remember this one day, I cold called 30 businesses in a day, trying to get their sponsorship. I got rejected 30 times in eight hours. It was painful, but I persisted and I kept going. And we got traction. We now have this big team of volunteers, amazing volunteers. We have multiple programs, and we've had everyone from the Foreign Minister of Australia, Julie Bishop, to the highest woman in the Australian Labor Party, Tanya Plibersek, coming along and mentoring girls at our events. So every individual has the ability to create change. 
Every person has the ability to move mountains with their bare hands. And the next thing you need, you need your head. Everyone is a genius in something. Everyone has a strength that you can hone in on and use. And your weaknesses, you can get other people to support you with that. And they can be unorthodox. It can be everything from social media to networking to engineering to design. Find what you're good at and use it. Use it to start. So what am I good at? I think other than drinking incredibly dangerous amounts of Coke Zero, I would be good at probably networking is where my skill set lies. Networking and maybe empathy. And then there are things that I'm really bad at. For example, back to the website, right before our country to Canberra, um, leadership competitions, were, our winners were announced last year. I crashed our entire website, I actually left it open to a major hacking incident, which as CEO isn't ideal. But you know what? I had amazing volunteers. I had people that could fill those gaps. And so where does something like networking help me? Well, I remember at the start of Country to Canberra, we didn't even have a logo yet, we didn't have a business card, but I saw this awesome local politician out and about, and I thought, you know what, she'd be great to come along and mentor girls at our events. So I summoned the courage, and I kind of fought past about 10 other people to get to the front of the line where she was, and I used my skills, I sold my vision to her, and lo and behold, she accepted my invitation, and she has been at every major event we've held since. And the last thing you need to be a change maker is your heart. You need to be clear about why you do what you do. What is your vision? What are your values? And when you know what they are, when you're really clear about what your passion is and why you're doing what you're doing, every step, every hard decision, every late night is worth it. For me, I'm actually such a nerd that I wrote out my life vision with one of my mentors, and this was the beginning of it. This mentor also believes that I'm going to live to 120, so that's pretty great. But essentially, this was the beginning, and it's developed a bit since then. But ultimately, my vision is to empower young women and girls, and my values lie in community, and they lie in equality. And yes, there are late nights, yes, it can be hard, yes, I have a slight soft drink addiction, and yes, I'm partial to the occasional cry fest. But when people ask me, why do you do it? Why are you stressing yourself out over this? Why are you prematurely aging yourself? I can go back to this vision, back to these values, and then I can tell them stories like this. So this is Alicia. She was one of our Power Trip winners, and when she came out on the program, she was incredibly shy and nervous. But as the program went on, she blossomed. And when we went to the airport to drop her off, she broke down in tears. And she told me that no one had ever believed in her the way that we did. She went back to her community, she became head girl, and she's still doing phenomenal things. I do it because I love my community. I want to make it better. So I urge everyone, think about what you're passionate about. Think about what change you want to make in your community. It doesn't have to be big. It can be big, but it can be small. And use your hands, use your head, use your heart, and join me in creating a better community for us all. Thank you.